So, Rabia, thank you. Uh, thanks for the, being here. I appreciate very much your testimony and what you're bringing to the conversation today. I want to just uh, set a bit of a story of what's happening in Oklahoma. In, in 2018, uh, my state uh, legalized medical marijuana. In 2019, we had the largest amount of foreign land sales in the country the next year. And what we found are tens of thousands of acres that have been purchased by Chinese nationals in my state that they then have partnered with um, Mexican cartels uh, to be able to grow marijuana in Oklahoma and then ship it all over the country. Um, we have seen a proliferation of Chinese grow operations that's happened there. Um, that <clears throat> has, has been a, a shock to the system, a lot of folks in rural Oklahoma, of how many places uh, that they can't drive down a rural road uh, because there are folks standing there with ARs at the edge of a fence uh, saying, hey, you're not allowed down this road anymore. It's been an enormous shift that has occurred. So saying all that the, on the criminal side of things, on it, uh, I, I engaged on this and have found several other folks that are watching Chinese purchases of agricultural land uh, around the country and have seen a 100,000 plus acre increase just in the last year of Chinese purchases of agricultural land around the nation. Uh, I have a bill now called the Soil Act, which just does the CFIUS process uh, for uh, foreign purchases of agricultural land that are currently exempt. Uh, you, can do, uh, foreign, you can do any foreign purchases of agricultural land and you don't have to go through the CFIUS process you'd have to do for technology. We have a 10-mile barrier around our military bases. I'd like to extend that to 50-mile barrier, uh, knowing that if you're 10 and a half miles away from a military base on a high hill, you're still looking right down into a military base and with a Chinese operation that's owned. So th there's a lot of questions that we have about just the ownership of agricultural land in some of the Chinese criminal activity that's actually happening in the United States, uh, facilitating partnerships with others. My question to you, has you, have you seen this in other areas of the country? What would you recommend on agricultural land purchases in particular, and also the Chinese criminal organizations where it seems the Chinese government is looking away, fully aware of what's actually happening in the engagement of that, but looking away to increase a negative influence on Americans by their, acti by their activities here? I can address the Chinese agricultural land piece. Um, you know. I would be in favor in particular of legislation that increases the capacity of USDA and other agencies to monitor sales. Right now, the reporting mechanisms that are in place have extremely weak enforcement right. and weak capacity behind them. So we don't actually have an accurate view, as far as I understand, of the picture of foreign land sales. And so for us to understand the scale and scope of, of any risk that might be there, we need to improve that. So that, that's one area that needs a lot of attention. Beyond just the military basing um, proximity issue. Um, Xi Jinping in the last couple of years has declared food security to be a paramount interest to the CCP because the CCP is highly dependent on foreign supplies of soybeans, wheat, other commodities as well, um, cooking oils. Uh, and, you know, this is partly reducing their vulnerability to the ability of the U.S. to impose economic sanctions and cut off trade in the event of, 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 of a conflict. So food security is, is a top-line agenda item for the party. Various investment groups and Chinese conglomerates are responding to the market signal that the Communist Party sent and saying, okay, this is important to them. We're going to go out to the world, not just the United States, and begin acquiring the technologies and the know-how to enhance our ability to generate more productivity in our domestic agricultural sector. So it isn't just about SIGINT, you know, uh, with regard to, to military bases. It's also about developing farms in the United States that will have access to our seeds, to our cultivars, to our animal husbandry, to our techniques that make American agriculture so incredibly productive so that they can learn all of that and take it back to China in the same way that they've done with other industries. Anyone else add to that? Um, I was going to say, I, I'm not familiar with agriculture, but when you speak about organized crime and when we talk about some of the examples of, let's say, transnational oppression in Taiwan, there are close ties again, you know, in terms of uh, triads or, or organized crime with links to the CCP. We've seen that in Hong Kong and uh, years ago, attacks on people like Jimmy Lai that were done by then. And I think more recently, one of the dis these campaigns of disinformation networks that were taken down were also using networks that were run by businesses with organized crime ties in Southeast Asia. So this phenomenon may not only be uh, limited to, to the agriculture sector. Mr. Chairman, could I, uh, 
Could I ask one more quick question on it? It's about the sister cities, and I know you've talked about this a little bit as well, but this seems to be an active thing for uh, the Chinese to now pursue cities. What are the real risks to communities? If a city says, you know what, China's a growing economy, there's business there, uh, we're engaging with Chinese uh, business individuals, what is the threat to a community in one of these sister cities relationships, and who are the Chinese sending to the United States in that sister city relationship? So there are a couple of threats. Number one, it undercuts American national foreign policy. A lot of these sister city agreements, the Chinese would like to assert uh, claims and assertions about what U.S. policy is or isn't with regard to Taiwan, perhaps other places beyond that too. That's the prerogative of the federal government, first of all. So we shouldn't be dividing America internally that way. But most importantly, um, there are members of the multi-ethnic Chinese diaspora who live in these cities, who are from Taiwan, who are from Tibet, who are from Xinjiang, who are from a vast array of places. And inserting language that endorses PRC policy on issues with regard to territory and ethnicity in those sister city agreements is an insult to them. And it also makes them feel unsafe because their communities suddenly are allying with, with a government that in many instances they've experienced oppression from personally. I would just add to that about the leverage points. I think even if there is a sister city agreement, one is to look at the fine print. And this goes to also some of the Confucius Institute agreements. Like part of it is just knowing what to, at that negotiation stage, what to say no to. But two, to realize at some point, there may be a member of one of these communities who comes before the town council or the city council and asks for a resolution for the Dalai Lama's birthday or to support something else or, or to talk about how, and you're going to get a call from your sister city partner asking you to not support that resolution or, um, or the sister city relationship could be endangered. So I think that would be also being ready for that, being at the beginning to say, even if you pursue a sister city relationship, to say, we want you to understand that we have members of in our community and we care about these causes and we will continue to speak out. If you can do that at the beginning, it's less likely that they'll even try later on. Thank you.